Good morning, I'm Lucy Beadnell with the ARC of Northern Virginia, and I'm really excited to be talking with you all today about the basics of Medicaid waiver. I'm gonna share some slides. If you are watching this recording at a later date, feel free to reach out to us anytime for a copy of the slides or at the ARC of Northern Virginia's webpage, thearcofnova.org. You can select our resource library, which brings up an alphabetical menu. And when you select waivers, there's an FAQ about Medicaid waiver document that's right at the top. And that FAQ waiver document in just two pages reviews a lot of the basics about waivers and gives information on how to apply. A little bit about the Arc of Northern Virginia, if you're not familiar with us, we have been around for 62 years now. We do a lot of advocacy, and that would be grassroots advocacy to change budgets, laws, rules, regulations, things like that that would impact many, many people with developmental disabilities and their families across the state. We do a great deal of free education, which are often things like these webinars or other sorts of workshops. We answer many questions over the course of the year, many thousands. Please don't ever hesitate to reach out. We love answering questions. To make sure that we are answering them in the most systematic way possible, we try and have people go through our online portal, which will force people to give answers like, how old is the person with the disability and what's their diagnosis? Because that means our answers can be a lot more accurate and eliminates the need for us to go back and forth with you a bunch of times. We want to be able to answer you fast and accurately so that you get what you need right away. We have a lot of one-page guides on that online resource library that I mentioned, lots of online toolkits for information across the lifespan. So never hesitate to reach out, but also know that a lot of answers to common questions are right there on the website itself if you want to look through. We also have a team on our staff that do case management support coordination for these waivers that we're going to be talking about today. And that team also oversees our public guardianship program. We run a special needs trust that serves DC, Maryland, and Virginia, and helps make sure that people with disabilities can keep, save, or inherit money while staying eligible for programs like the Medicaid waiver. And since that touches a little bit on waiver, I will allude to it once today during our presentation. And our hippest team is our Tech for Independent Living team. They work on free customized apps to help people with disabilities maximize their independence with things like daily living skills, safety, work, and travel. So today we're going to dive into Medicaid waivers. I'll give a quick overview first about what the Medicaid waiver is designed to do. And then we'll talk about how you would know if you're eligible for a waiver. Then we'll dive into some of the services those waivers offer. And if that sounds interesting, then we'll continue right on into the application process, how and where to apply. If the waiver that seems like it's a good fit for you has a waiting list, we'll talk about how to navigate that waiting list. And we'll end with my contact information. Again, no question too big, too small, too often. Reach out with anything and everything you have. So diving right into the purpose of waivers, the Medicaid waiver system is called that because Medicaid is the health insurance that pays for waiver services. We often think of Medicaid as health care, you know, what would pay for doctor, pharmacy, hospital visits, those kinds of things. And that's true. But within that larger Medicaid system is the waiver program. And the waiver program offers an extra bundle of services to people with particular needs. So in this case, people with developmental disabilities are able to get more support than the Medicaid program would usually offer. And the way that we write the rules to do that and fund that is a special permission with the federal government, if you will, and that's where the term waiver comes from. The federal government has given us flexibility in how we run our Medicaid program to offer additional resources to people with a range of disabilities. We talk about waivers a lot at the Arc of Northern Virginia, and that's because in Virginia, they really are meant to be your one-stop shop for people with a big range of needs and ages and diagnoses. They offer lifelong supports. So for someone with a disability, if you said, I have high needs or low needs, I'm younger or I'm older, I would say, okay, probably we're still going to be looking at waivers no matter what. 
and ideally you would be able to keep it and use it throughout your entire life and the waiver would flex with you as you were younger and perhaps needed more care there would be more care as you needed help to leave school and get a job it would be there and as you reached your maximum independence maybe we pull back some supports to give you space and then maybe you get older and need more care again and we could layer that back in the waiver really is the only public, meaning free or low cost, way to fund services like this in Virginia. So really important to get involved in the waiver process as early as possible, but no such thing is too late. We're going to talk about the two types of waivers that Virginia offers today. At the top of the screen in a dark blue color are the names of Virginia's three developmental disability waivers. As a group, those three waivers are called our DD for Developmental Disability Waivers. Their specific names are the Community Living Waiver, which is designed to support people with the highest level of need, the Family and Individual Supports Waiver, which is designed for the great majority of people with developmental disabilities who have a medium to moderate level of need, and the Building Independence Waiver, which is really designed for adults with developmental disabilities who need just a little bit of help here and there. Though there are technically three types of DD waivers, the eligibility for them is the same, the application process is the same, the waiting list is the same, and many, many, many services are the same between them. So for a lot of what we're doing today, I'll talk about them as a group because in many ways, they're pretty much identical. We'll highlight some of the differences when we talk about waiver services though. The other waiver program that Virginia offers is called the Commonwealth Coordinated Care or CCC Plus waiver. If you knew about waivers prior to 2016 or 17, it used to be called the EDCD and the tech waiver. So Virginia has these two different types of waivers. And as we talk through the waiver system today, I'll constantly be comparing them. As we look at applications or eligibility, we'll look at it for the DD waiver and for the CCC plus waiver, back and forth with everything that we talk about. So let's start with a high level overview of the two to sort of get some mental filing cabinets going for ourselves. When we think about the DD waiver, we would be keeping in mind that the person applying needs a developmental disability diagnosis. So autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, things like that are very common diagnoses, but of course there are thousands of um, genetic and disease condition syndromes that count as a developmental disability. So there's not an exhaustive list. It would be anything that falls under that umbrella of a developmental disability, including intellectual disability, that would be eligible here. And the DD waivers have a pretty big menu of services, options for people with disabilities who are living in their family home, living in their own home, needing to live with others, choices for work and daytime services, going out in the community and learning new skills. There are a lot of options there under the DD waivers, including up to 24 seven awake staff. If someone with a disability, for example, needed um, support overnight to eat, take medications, go to the bathroom, um, be rotated in bed, those kinds of things. The DD waivers come with a case manager called a support coordinator, and their job is to make sure that the DD waiver user not only understands and uses the DD waiver system to the best of their ability, but really how do we look at resources outside the DD waiver system? Grants, volunteer opportunities, family and friends, right? How do we look at the whole picture of this person and build together a plan for them to have the best life possible? So in many ways, it's a great program, but the downside is it has a long waiting list. As I alluded to in the beginning, we'll talk about that waiting list later on in the presentation. But because it has a waiting list, we also talk about the CCC Plus waiver. That waiver requires a diagnosis of some kind of disability, which could be a developmental disability, but also requires a diagnosis of a significant medical need. That waiver was originally designed to divert older adults from nursing homes, but it doesn't have an age minimum. It has a much smaller menu of services for care than the DD waiver does, more like caregivers to come into your own home, some nursing, but not 24-7 care, not employment services, not out-of-home residential care, those kinds of things. That waiver has a 56-hour-a-week cap on that one-to-one -one caregiver who would come and support the person with a disability and does not have a case manager to kind of help pull all the pieces together. 
but it has no waiting list. And so we talk about it. For perspective, right now in Virginia, the DD waivers have a waiting list of about 15,000 people. And at any given point in time, somewhere between a quarter to a third of those 15,000 people not only have a developmental disability that qualifies them for the DD waiver, they also have enough medical need that they're able to use the CCC plus waiver while they're waiting. Again, this is why we talk about both of them. So if you have a loved one with a lot of medical needs or you yourself have a lot of medical needs, we'll talk through how or why you may want to try and use the CCC Plus waiver while waiting on the other program to become available. If you're someone who does not have or is not supporting someone with a lot of medical needs, then just know the CCC Plus waiver is there for you if by chance that person ever has a change in medical status and needs it, but otherwise you can give your brain a little bit of a rest while we talk through that option. So first we'll dive into how you know if you're eligible for waivers. And eligibility is looked at in three criteria. The diagnosis, which we touched on briefly. Someone's functional support needs. How much help do they need to get done with daily activities? And financial eligibility. So like I promised, as we talk about each of these pieces of eligibility, we will compare the DD and the CCC plus waiver. This is a really wordy slide you absolutely don't have to read. It's the definition of developmental disability that Virginia formerly, formally uses, if you would like to look through it. But if you have a developmental disability or a loved one who does, you probably know this pretty well. This disability onsets in childhood, including at birth. It's likely to continue indefinitely. We see lots of needs in a range of areas of life. Right. So with this, we would expect that someone with a developmental disability would have a formal diagnosis that usually comes from a psychologist. And the DD waivers also require that when they look at that diagnosis to show you're diagnostically eligible for this waiver, that diagnosis also includes an IQ score. I want to be really clear in saying there is no IQ minimum or maximum. They're just looking for it. So don't worry about whatever the score is or whether or not you think it's accurate. But when you're applying for this waiver, you'll need to show a copy of that diagnosis and related IQ score. And that's how you'd know if you met the diagnostic eligibility for the DD waiver. For the CCC plus waiver, it's a little bit different. They'll definitely look at that disability diagnosis, but also medical diagnoses, which may come from doctor, a nurse, OTPT speech therapists in the person's life, those kinds of things. And there's an assessment that's used to determine if people have enough medical and support needs to be eligible for this waiver. There's a link in the middle of the screen now that will be on the slides when I hand them out and is also on that waiver FAQ document in our resource library I alluded to that I think is a great, very unofficial self-help tool to determine if this waiver may be a good fit for you. The tricky piece about a diagnosis for the CCC plus waiver is definitely you need a disability diagnosis, definitely you need a medical diagnosis, but on top of that, we need to make sure that there's a notable amount of medical need. And we're going to dive into that next when we talk about functional supports for these waivers. So for the DD waiver, we say, okay, if you have a developmental disability diagnosis, we need to look and see if you have enough support needs throughout the day to be eligible for this program. We assess that in Virginia with a survey called the VIDES, which is an acronym for the Virginia Individual Developmental Disabilities eligibility survey. There's a version of the VIDES from birth before the third birthday, the third birthday to the day before the 18th birthday, and for adults. And that assessment really looks at how does this person with a disability compare to typically developing peers in terms of how much help they need to do things like take care of their own health care, communicate, maximize their independence, manage money, manage money and pay bills, um, get about, manage challenging behaviors, learn new things, those sorts of things. Again, at the arcofnova.org, if you select our resource library and go to the waivers section, you can see the three versions of the VIDES. They're public documents. And in my philosophy is if someone is going to give you the test before you have to take the test, Take a few minutes and look it over. The first few pages of the VIDES explain how it's scored and are the scoring guide. So once you open up that VIDES, you can go section by section. You can answer those questions 
yourself at home as practice and say, huh, how much help do we really need to do these things? And then you'd flip back to the front of the vibes and you would look at it and say, all right, we'll transfer our answers in. Yes, absolutely. I can see that we should be eligible, but I know that I really have to emphasize question 10 in the third category. I can see otherwise we wouldn't be eligible in that category, right? So looking at it ahead of time gives you a sense of what examples, what information should I be prepared to share and how fragile, if you will, is, a, is our eligibility, right? Do I really need to make sure they write down exactly what I'm saying or we meet in all eight out of eight categories and, and we're just fine here? So I think that's something that's worth thinking about. The eligibility test for the CCC Plus waiver is different. It's a screening tool called the Uniform Assessment Instrument, often called the UAI. And if you or a loved one has ever had a long-term stay in a hospital or like physical rehab facility or nursing home, it's the same document. Unlike the VIDES, there's not a scoring guide, but it is still public and you absolutely can look at it ahead of time. You'll see it's a lot of questions about hands-on care with things like bathing, dressing, restroom, eating, and medical care. And this is where I said it's not really just a medical diagnosis that makes you eligible for the CCC Plus waiver. It's how much help you need. So let's think of that as in terms of an example. You told me that your loved one had an epilepsy, a seizure diagnosis. I would say, okay, that may make them diagnostically eligible for the CCC Plus waiver, but how much help do they need to manage those seizures? And if you said, you know, they haven't had a seizure in 15 years, we don't even see a neurologist, I would say, okay, then we're not functionally eligible. We don't have enough medical support needs to be eligible. But if you told me, oh, we have a seizure protocol, we see the neurologist every couple of months, everyone around them has to be trained to manage their seizures, even if those seizures are really infrequent, if we're still actively seeking care, developing a protocol, training people on how to, um, excuse me, how to see, notice those seizures and how to respond to them, then that more likely would make someone eligible. So it's not just with that waiver, do you have a medical diagnosis? It's do you have active medical support needs? And again, that self-assessment that I mentioned on the previous slide, I'll tool back to it, is a great way at looking at whether or not you're likely eligible for that. So like I said, eligibility, we look at three things, your diagnosis, which we've talked about, your functional needs, we've talked about the tool that assesses that, and then financial eligibility for these two waivers is pretty much the same. They both have a monthly gross income cap for the waiver user. So that person with a disability, if they're two or 22 or 82, that's the only financial eligibility we're looking at. That waiver user's gross monthly income cap in 2024 is 2000 820, actually it should be $29. Um, so the person with a disability can't have more monthly income than that and stay eligible for their waiver as of right now. Once the person with a waiver has more income per month than about $1,500, just a little over that amount, they may start to have a copay for their waiver services. But if the person with a disability has less income than that per month, including they're a child and they have no income whatsoever, then there's no cost to use the waiver no matter how many services you have in any kind of quantity. I wanna really emphasize that the income and assets of the parents or anyone else in the household do not matter in terms of the eligibility of the person getting the waiver. We're only looking at them. This is another way that when Medicaid waivers are different than Medicaid health insurance that looks at whole household resources. I also wanted to note that not only do we look at income for the waiver user, we look at their assets. That would be things like checking account plus savings account plus stocks they owned, or if someone put a savings bond in their name, those kinds of things that are really financial assets. For children, children are usually not legal property owners, we just kind of keep an eye on it. But once that person with a disability turns 18 and are a legal adult, they should not ever have more than $2,000 in assets all combined. Otherwise, they risk losing their eligibility for the waiver. And the exception to that $2,000 resource limit is if that money is in a special needs trust or an ABLE account. Like I mentioned, we operate a special needs trust to try and make sure that people do stay eligible 
for programs like Medicaid and the waiver and social security benefits, housing vouchers, et cetera, without jeopardizing their ability to save or inherit money or those kinds of things that we want everybody to be able to do. At the arcofnovatrust.org, you can sign up for one of our free events, like a small group workshop or select make an appointment to do a one-to-one -one visit with our special needs trust team. If you think, well, we should probably talk about this, either to put money in now and immediately be eligible for programs like this, or to set up knowing that later we want to fund it with a life insurance policy and inheritance money that we hope to save later, those kinds of things. So now let's talk about services that these waivers offer, bearing in mind that when you get a waiver, you'll meet with someone to talk about the exact kind of services that make sense for the support needs and the schedule with the person with a disability. So we wouldn't offer employment services to a seven-year-old, for example. So let's dive in a little bit. These slides look busy. Don't panic about that. Um, it's just meant to give a visual comparison. So across the top, we can see our three DD waivers, community living, family and individual supports, and our building independence waiver. And on the far right-hand side, we see our CCC plus waiver. The first services I'll talk about are residential services, by which I mean, likely you're not living with your parents anymore. You are an adult and you are living with someone without a disability who's a live-in caregiver in shared living. You are living in an apartment with drop-in supports because you really need very little, like independent living. You are living in sponsored residential where you move into the home of a family. It's generally not your biological family, and they help provide your care. You are living in a group home where you have a bunch of roommates and staff that you didn't necessarily choose, but there's staff there 24 hours a day, or you're living in a supported living situation where you have maybe one or two roommates that are people that you like that you chose. You have staff there up to 24 hours a day that you like that you chose, those kinds of things. And here you can see all three of our DD waivers offer some manner of residential services. Our CCC Play Plus waiver offers no residential services away from the family. So a lot of what drives the specific DD waiver that people are offered when they're finally offered one, is what residential service, if any, do they immediately need? Not we want to move in five years and two years and 10 years, but what do you need right now is often the driver to determine what the waiver someone gets offered initially is. And then over time, if someone, for example, gets offered a waiver when they're a teenager, they're 16 years old, they're still living at home with parents, so they're offered the family and individual supports waiver because they didn't need any heavy-duty residential services, but then they turn 18, 19, 20, whatever it is, and they're ready to leave the family home. Then it may be time to say, okay, we need to put in a request to move to that community living waiver. Now is the time that we need that heavy-duty residential services, and you'd work with your um, waiver team to do that. All of the DD waivers, now I'll flip to day and employment services, offer essentially the complete gamut of day and employment services. So whatever your lead need level is and whatever kind of DD waiver you have is, you can have the full range of employment and day services. That may mean... You know, you are working sometimes, you're working in a small group with other people with disabilities, you're working with a boss that's specially trained to support you. Um, maybe it means you're working on skill building so that you can get ready for work. Maybe it means we're working on life skills and supports and therapies in a group day environment. There are all kinds of options that you'll be able to tour and explore when you have a DD waiver and are looking at day and employment options. And again, for comparison, our CCC Plus waiver doesn't really offer anything in this category. But when we dive into services you can get in-home, by which I mean in the home where the person with a disability is living with family, or in a home where the person with a disability just want services to drop in. And here we see our CCC Plus waiver finally bring up some options. The waivers offer in-home skill builders that can help almost like an IEP, right? The person with a disability say, I want to learn to meal plan. I want to learn to make my own bed. I want to learn to whatever. And then it can be broken down into steps and we'd chart progress and we'd have someone work with the person with the disability on that. Our DD waivers offer companion services, maybe for someone with an disability who's an adult, who doesn't necessarily need someone hands-on caregiving, but maybe needs someone around just for safety and companionship. 
that's an option. Most of the waivers offer up to 480 hours a year of respite. That really means we'll look at whatever your usual weekly service hours are. Let's say you're in school, you're a younger person with a developmental disability, and so you only have, I'm making up a number, 20, 25 hours a week of care to cover after school and the weekends. But there are weeks like spring break and summer breaks when you need a whole lot of extra care because you aren't in school. Then it would be a great example of a time you would use those annual 480 respite hours and you would plug in those hours to use a caregiver during those times when you didn't usually need someone, but that week you had a different schedule. All four of the waivers, all three DD and the CCC plus waiver offer up to $5,000 a year to change the home where the person with a disability lives to make it more adaptive or more um, inclusive. And that also includes the car that the person with a disability owns or that's used to drive them. So wider doorways, ramps, lifts, um, other kinds of safety features are really common. All of the waivers offer the personal emergency response system, which would be a push button monitoring system so that the person with a disability only has to identify something is wrong, I need help. And in pushing that button, it would call a 911 operator who would be essentially given a profile that would say, this is who this person is, where they live, their needs, who we think you should send, those kinds of things. It can be a great tool for growing independence with people who are ready to be alone sometimes, but may have trouble navigating an emergency or unusual situation. Um, our DD waivers all offer electronic home-based supports. That could be a specialized tablet or computer that sits on the person's kitchen countertop. And anytime they're thinking, ah, I'm feeling lonely, I'm feeling anxious, or I'm stuck and I can't remember what I'm supposed to do now, they could remotely call for a caregiver who could be there like that, but wouldn't be in their face and space all of the time that they didn't need them. That could be doors that automatically lock themselves or stoves that shut themselves off, those kinds of things that can help people be more independent. All of the waivers offer assistive technology funding. That's up to $5,000 a year for portable technology. I will say the overwhelming majority of those requests I see are for phones and tablets with software to help the person communicate or be more independent, but it can be other kinds of technology for sure. Um, our DD waivers offer crisis support, people to come out on site while someone is having a crisis or crisis respite homes. Our DD waivers all offer community guides. Um, there is a housing community guide service, for example. So if you're someone with a disability who's looking at moving into your own apartment, you could contract with a housing community guide through your waiver who would help you look for apartments, get a housing voucher, um, talk with your landlord, get your lease set up, help you find the furniture that you need to move in, all those kinds of missing pieces that can be really hard to navigate. Um, I will note in terms of medical services, and here we see the CCC Plus waiver offers some. Um, the DD waivers offer, if someone needs it, a lot of nursing options, you know, either a nurse to drop in and oversee care, nurses who work in shifts. I would be the first to say it's really hard to get this service because the waiver has a low reimbursement rate for nursing, but it is something that's an option. Um, so that's a kind of a, a quick overview of services and related options. But again, once you're offered a waiver, you would really sit down with a team and dive through that in-depth tour providers, those kinds of things. So let's talk about how you would apply for these waivers. For the DD waivers, everyone has to go through their local community services board, often called CSB for short. In Northern Virginia, those are all based upon the county or city where you live. So if you live in Arlington County, it's the Arlington Community Services Board. Anywhere in Fairfax or Fairfax City is the Fairfax Community Services Board. Alexandria, Alexandria Services Board, Loudoun and Prince William, the same. Um, if you need contact information, there's a link that's on these slides to find a community services board in another part of the state. But when you call, you should expect them to say, Hi, how can I help? You say something like, I heard about these DD waivers and we'd really like to apply. Then they'll mail out a packet of information for you to fill out. 
there'll be things that you as the person with the disability or parent caregiver know, right? They're addressed, their diagnosis. And you'll send that back along with the proof of that diagnosis, that psychological evaluation and IQ score. They'll look at that and say, great, you're diagnostically eligible. You've got the right diagnosis to apply for this program. Now let's look at your functional needs. And they'll sit down with you and do that VIDES assessment that we talked about, where they ask about how much help the person needs with daily living activities. And then they'll say, okay, now you're functionally eligible. We're going to put you on a waiting list for this program. And I'll circle back to that waiting list in just a second. For the CCC plus waivers, you're calling your local Department of Social Services. In Fairfax, it's called the Department of Family Services. Numbers for them are on the screen here and a link to find if you're outside of Northern Virginia. In that case, you'd be answering questions right on the phone. Usually they do a little bit of a screening to ask right away about diagnoses, um, bathing, dressing, restroom, medical care kinds of things. Again, things you'll probably know off the top of your head, but good to be in a quiet space where you're really thinking through all of that. And if that phone screening goes well, they send out a nurse who asks very similar questions in person. And that nurse goes back and makes a decision to say, oh, we think this person has the right diagnosis, disability plus medical needs, the right functional support needs. They really need help with medical care and hands-on care. We think they're eligible. And in that case, they'd say, this waiver has no waiting list. Let's start setting up services. And then you begin in earnest to start to let the services you needed, line up caregivers, those kinds of things. If you are applying for the DD waivers and are looking at navigating the waiting list, there are some important things to know. Though there are three separate types of DD waivers, like I mentioned, they all share a single waiting list. And like I mentioned, the waiver that you are offered is usually based upon your immediate residential need, right? Waiting time can be very unpredictable since it's based upon urgency of need. There are 15,000 plus people across the state waiting for these waivers. And we look at how quickly does this person need help or do they already um, have to live in some state of crisis? So that would be things like, has the person graduated or they're right about to graduate and they have no other options for a day or employment program? Um, does one or both caregiver have their own health or mental health needs that make it challenging to provide care? Does the person with the disability have medical or behavioral or care needs we're really struggling to meet with other resources? Um, are there multiple people with disabilities in the household and we can't find a way to support everyone as best we can? Those are the sorts of things that would push someone higher up in terms of urgency. And that waiting list is managed by the Community Services Board, the CSB we talked about, where you apply. So at least once a year, you should hear from the Community Services Board as they say, do you have any updates for us? And that's a great chance to share. In the last year, mom got diagnosed with diabetes or dad with cancer, and that's made things harder. Or puberty's hit, and all of a sudden we're seeing these new challenging behaviors. Or we're approaching graduation and we're really worried about whether or not there'll be a waiver there, right? That is your opportunity to share why you really need services and when. You don't have to wait for them to contact you. You are welcome to call them or email them or whatever suits you whenever you like. And I would say, if you're really struggling, you know, maybe even a monthly contact saying, you know, this month we had these behaviors we couldn't address. We had these medical needs that we couldn't find a way to address. We had these problems going on. And this is why we need a waiver, right? Because those are the people deciding who gets the waiver when and which type of waiver as the state funds them. You want them to really understand your need. Um, so on that waiting list, people will be put into one of three priorities, priority one, two, or three. The way Virginia waiver rules are written is that we really have to serve everybody in priority one or offer them care before we move down that list. And people in priority one are those folks, like I talked about, who meet some stage of crisis. Governor Youngkin just last two months ago came out with a plan in a state budget that says, in the next two years, he wants everyone on priority one to be offered a waiver. He doesn't want anybody waiting in crisis, which would be a massive and wonderful leap ahead for Virginia. So if you are someone who's been thinking, goodness, we really need this waiver, 
this is the time to be contacting your community services board and making sure they have you on that priority one waiting list. Odds are very good. All of those people are going to be served, about 3,500 of them in the next two years. Really, really big deal. If you are on priority two or three, it's a good time to be making the push to be on priority one if you think you have urgent needs or to know, hey, maybe we actually won't have to go into a crisis to get help. It seems like Virginia is trying to get ahead of things. Um, I'll put my contact information on the screen here. Always the fastest way to reach me is email. I'm almost never sitting next to my phone, but if you want to send me an email and say, we need to have a chat on the phone, it's too, I can't type this out or we want to have a Zoom or what have you. Absolutely, we can do that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and take some questions from folks that have put them in the Q&A, but please feel free to ask other questions. Okay. Oh, here's a great one. What happens if you turn down a waiver that's offered to you? Um, the answer to that is complex, and it depends upon why you're turning it down. So let's say you have, you're have you the parent of an adult child who's 20, and they're ready to move out of the home. They really, really, really need to do that right away. You reached a point where they're not safe at home anymore. But the waiver that you're offered doesn't really cover residential services that would support your loved one. You could say, I don't think that's the right waiver for our need. I would like to turn it down. I, Lucy, would advise against this. Generally speaking, it is faster and better to say, okay, this may not be the perfect waiver for what we need, but I'm willing to try it because it's more than the nothing we have now for six months. And if after that six months, I can show you this waiver has not been effective in meeting our needs, at that point, we can request to move to another waiver. This most often happens when people are offered the family and individual supports, the sort of middle tier DD waiver that doesn't have 24-7 um, residential options readily available. And the family says, oh, but we need 24-7 residential. They've got to move away from home. Needs are really complicated. So then after six months or so of trying to use that middle tier waiver, they say, oh, can we please move up to that community living waiver that would offer more residential options? And then you'd work with your support coordinator to say, Yep, I can see why there's a need. Let's put you on um, sort of, it, it is a waiting list, but it's not like you give up what you have to wait again. It's like, let's put you on the list to be next in line to get bumped up to one of those community living waivers when one is available. And that's advantageous, like I said, because usually that means you go from having no supports to something you can at least try. And generally speaking, that move from that family and individual supports to a higher tier waiver the community living waiver is much faster than just going back on the whole statewide waiting list and waiting again until something is available to you. Um, if you're turning the waiver down for another reason, let's see, once ever I had someone say, I don't think I need it right now because I am working and I'm pretty independent, even though I'm eligible. Um, I just don't want to go through the hassle of dealing with this right now, but I think I will in the future. In that case, the person was allowed to stay on the waiting list, but they got bumped way, way down that waiting list because we knew this person definitely isn't urgently in need. This person may turn down services if we offer them in the few, in the near future. So then it was sort of incumbent upon that family to reach out and tell the community services board when their needs changed and they really did need waiver services in the future. Again, I'm a big fan of Take it when it is offered <laughs> and use it to the best of your ability because you just don't know when it's going to come around again. But I know everyone's life's a little different. Does the DD diagnosis from the school system apply? Yes, lots of people use a diagnosis from a school psychologist. Just pull out that diagnosis and look at it. Make sure there is a diagnosis given and that there's an IQ score that was given. Sometimes people say, actually, Though we don't have that yet, it would be really helpful for this IEP process or 504 plan, whatever the student has, to do that. And they can ask the school, I would like to request a diagnosis and IQ score for educational reasons. But then once you have it for educational reasons, you could also use it to apply for the waiver. Um, other ways people get those diagnoses, usually through insurance with a psychologist that your insurance covers, or sometimes people private pay to go to a psychologist if for whatever reason they would rather not go through the school or through private insurance. 
Yes, the recording of this will be sent out hopefully in the next couple of days as soon as our staff team can get it posted. I'll be able to download it and send it to them today. I just need it to get up on YouTube. Could I recommend where someone could get a, a ODD diagnosis and certification? So we just kind of talked through this. So sometimes the school does it, um, a private psychologist through your health insurance or that you privately pay. If you have a loved one who is um, applying for social security benefits for the first time, they're 18 and or older, or for DARS or state employment contracting uh, to help people with disabilities get jobs for the first time, and there's a diagnosis that's really old or not really clear, sometimes they'll do that testing, but it's very rare. I see someone go that route. Mostly it's either school psychology evaluations or someone through insurance. I have a parent who's interested in starting a trust for her 21-year-old who has autism. Where would she start? Great question. So the arcofnovatrust.org is where I would send them. And there's a little ribbon that runs through the middle of the screen at the top. Click events and they do a bunch with that trust team. My favorite starting event is called Trust Talk Tuesdays and they do it every other Tuesday. It's on Zoom and it's a small group session where we'll talk, our team will talk a little bit about the trust and then answer questions. It's a very good way, kind of like this webinar, to get your head wrapped around what a trust can do or how it would make sense. And then also at the arcofnovatrust.org, going to make an appointment and setting up a one-to-one -one appointment with our team once you've got the basics, because you don't want to use up that one-to-one -one appointment, just learning the same kinds of things that are out there and we talk about in every session. And your one-to-one -one appointment, it's a great time to really drill down to, these are the needs we want to make sure we're funded. Um, here are the assets. Here are the people who may want to pay into it. How should we structure this and really get things going? Yes, I'm happy to share a PDF version of the slides when I do the follow-up. And if you are watching this at a later time, always at the arcofnova.org at the top right of our screen, there's a little orange rectangle that says, I need help. And if you put a question in there, it comes directly to me and I can share the slides with you later, or you can go to our resource library for that waiver FAQ document that covers a lot of this. Does the diagnosis report need to be detailed like from a developmental pediatrician? No, it needs to be a diagnosis. It can't allude to a diagnosis. So it can't say like, we think the person may have autism or a previous report noted. It needs to say this person has autism, whatever their diagnosis is, and an IQ score. But it does not need to be like a 20 page, $5,000 neuropsych evaluation. Nothing fancy required. Diagnosis, IQ score. I've seen very short evaluations in some cases, like five-ish pages um, that can be used for this purpose. Can we apply for a DD waiver if we have a young child with a DD diagnosis, but whose IQ score hasn't been evaluated? Yes. And I don't go through this in detail a lot, but I'm glad that you raised it. If someone's under age nine, they're more lenient on what those diagnoses look like for exactly this reason. Sometimes it may be really hard to pin down an exact diagnosis or an IQ score on a kiddo who's really young. So if you went through early intervention or child find, you're getting special education services in school, those are the kinds of things you'd be sharing. And whatever sorts of diagnostic things that you had, even though it may not be a really clear diagnosis and IQ score before age nine. Once you're approved for the waiver, what's the renewal process? Great question. So every year you do that VIDES assessment that we talked about where it asks questions about the help you need to get through the day. Every year you'd show that you're, function you're financially eligible still, right? I'm not earning over that Medicaid waiver income cap. Um, I am keeping my bank account balance in check or have any other assets in a special needs trust, those kinds of things. Every um, and that's that's about it. And then you're supposed to keep using your waiver services. So if someone went months without using or even trying to use any waiver services, that waiver could possibly be taken away because they're saying, wait, we've got lots and lots of people waiting for this program. If you're not going to use it, we want to pass it on. But generally speaking, you keep passing the vibes each year, you keep staying financially eligible, and you keep using some kind of service. And that, for the most part, um, helps take care of things. The waiver, generally speaking, once people have it, they keep it indefinitely unless their needs changed and they're offered a different kind of waiver as a result. But for the most part, once people have it, they keep it throughout their lifespan. We have a community living waiver and have accepted it. Big congratulations. How often is it reevaluated or do you keep, oh God, great question. So yes, you will keep it for the rest of your life. Um, it's incredibly rare for someone with a community living waiver, again, that waiver that offers the highest level of support to later say, 
we don't need this anymore. We need a waiver that offers lower supports. It can happen, for example, if you got offered the waiver when your child was in their 20s, and then they spend their 20s and 30s really gaining a lot of independent life skills, and you may want to knock down to another waiver. Rare. Um, but generally speaking, once you have it, you keep it. You just continue to show each year you have the need with the vibes and the financial eligibility when you renew with Medicaid. Will being on Medicaid waivers impact the current medical insurance through parents' employment? Not in a negative way. If the child has insurance through their parents' job or through their own job, then absolutely that's fine. Medicaid is always the payer of last resort, meaning when someone bills insurance, Medicaid pays last. They want to see everyone else had a shot first, but it doesn't mean anything in terms of the person's Medicaid waiver eligibility. If someone has insurance through an employer-sponsored plan, their parents' employer or their own employer, I usually say it's a good idea to look into a program called HIP, H-I-P-P, -P, Health Insurance Premium Portability. I'm missing a P, messed up a P there somewhere. Um, but it is a plan through Medicaid because Medicaid's the payer of last resort that says, huh, is Medicaid. It actually is a big benefit to us when someone has an employer-sponsored plan because that employer-sponsored plan pays first when that person goes to the doctor or the hospital or the pharmacy. That really reduces our costs as Medicaid. So if someone enrolls in this special program called HIP, if they're eligible, then Medicaid will pay the premium each month to keep that person enrolled on the employer-sponsored plan. HIP rules are different and more flexible if it's someone under 18 who has both an employer-sponsored plan, in that case, almost always through the parents, as well as Medicaid health insurance. Once the person with a disability is 19 plus, it's much, much harder to get that HIP funding, but still possible. So I would say absolutely worth looking into. The Arc of Northern Virginia on our YouTube channel has a video about HIP. Um, but yes, you can absolutely have multiple insurances. Yes, absolutely. Things will be slight. Oh, another great question. Is there an ideal time to apply? As soon as you can is the ideal time to apply. I realize this webinar talked through a lot today, but it should be like a phone call, a packet of paper, a meeting, which not that any of us have a bunch of time to burn on our hands, but is not really overly burdensome and shouldn't be wildly time consuming. And because there's this long waiting list, because sometimes people like Governor Young can fund a huge chunk of it all at once, absolutely apply as soon as you can. You just never know when you're going to really, really need it. And at that point, you want to be able to pick up the phone and say, put us at the top of the list and not shoot, we've got to get a new diagnosis. We've got to apply for this program. Everything's falling apart, right? You want to be in a position to just slide right in when you most need it. And I don't talk a ton about this because the program's sort of tricky, but there is opportunities for people who are on the waiting list that are not available to people who haven't yet applied. If the person on the waiting list is over 18, there are opportunities for housing supports. If the person is on the waiting list at any age, there may be what's grant kind of style funding called the Individual and Family Support Program that can offer $500 or $1,000 depending upon circumstances each year to help the person. So absolutely, there are benefits that are relatively small to being on the waiting list, and you always want to be on um, as quickly as possible. If you have SSI, and for folks who don't know, that Supplemental Security Income, that's the base level Social Security monthly cash payment for adults with disabilities, do you need the diagnosis and IQ? They are still going to look to see if you have a diagnosis and IQ because the DD waivers require a DD diagnosis, whereas SSI benefits accept people with a much broader range of disabilities and diagnoses. So they want to know that you have the right diagnosis for this waiver. So yes, absolutely, they would still be looking, but it'll be easier when you ultimately apply for services and get things in place that they can see that SSI is already there. Um, if you don't have the type of waiver that matches your needs, that would be a conversation you'd have with the support coordinator, the person through the community services board, their case manager who helps shore things up for that person. So you would be saying, I think this is a much better strategic way to do it. This is what our waiver offers and everything we've tried. Here are the needs it hasn't met. That 
waiver over there, the community living waiver usually, offers these other things that we think would meet the need. And we've exhausted everything we can do here. Can you please help us apply for that one? And that sort of information about we've tried everything. Here's why it didn't work. Here are the unmet needs. Here's what we need instead is the exact same kind of information the support coordinator will use in their justification to put you on that list to move to the other kind of waiver. Can you use a school document that's a few years old? My son graduated in 2020. Yes, this is CSBs have some discretion, meaning they have a little bit of leeway in the documents they consider in terms of age for a diagnosis. So I would say for an adult, like over 18, usually they're looking for something that's at no more than seven years old. If it's seven and one month old, maybe they'll still take it, right? But they're not going to take something that's 15 years old. For a child, because children change, obviously, so very, very quickly, they're usually looking for something that's a little more recent, more like three to five-ish years old. So if your son's graduated in 2020 and they had diagnostic work done that year, I would be inclined to say, yeah, that's probably going to be accepted. In my opinion, if you have any kind of diagnostic paperwork, no matter the age, it's worth calling the CSB and getting the process started because they may say, find a way to accept what you have, but don't hold up making that call to apply thinking, oh, we've definitely got to go out and get a totally new evaluation and it's going to take months to get in with the psychologist and it'll take months to get the evaluation back. You don't want to hold yourself up all that time if you don't really need to. So definitely start the application process with the community services board. If they say this really doesn't work, then go and do some problem solving. Um, but it, then at least you've started the process and got your foot in the door. I think you said that if a person qualifies for a DD waiver and is on the waiting list, they can receive the CCC plus waiver. Yes, so they can receive services under the CCC plus waiver, which is a much smaller list, like we talked about, at which point they're offered a DD waiver, they give up the CCC plus waiver and transition to the DD waiver. The DD waiver has every service CCC plus waiver does and more. So you won't be losing any services. There's not a big gap in services um, if you move from one waiver to another. But absolutely, if you're eligible to get immediate help under that CCC plus waiver, it's a great thing to do. My son has a diagnostic report from 2022. That's really current in terms of diagnoses. So no matter his age, I would be inclined to say that's going to be absolutely no problem. The CSB can confirm that. How can you get on our email list? Um, we try and put people who sign up for webinars on the email list, but at the arcofnova.org, if you go to what's called our newsroom, it'll show some recent newsletters at the top. And at the bottom of that page, there's an actual link to sign up for the newsletter. The monthly income threshold for waivers, is that all earned and un unearned income combined? Yes. So like I said, 2,800, the slide said 23, it should be $29 a month is the maximum income you can have as a DD waiver holder. And that would include social security benefits you get, or you get through your parents or your work income, or if someone gives you a pension, or I mean, all those monthly income kinds of things combined that a regular monthly income would be counted toward that threshold. And it's gross. It's before taxes. I didn't have any luck getting an update on my four-year-old's DD waiver status from my CSB. I've called a dozen times. My golly. All I've gotten told is he's found eligible. What else can I do to gain some traction and get information on what the next steps are so he can get on the DD waiver, CCC plus waiver, and IFSP? Yes, that's the right acronym. Um, okay. This concerns me a lot, and this should never happen. Um, with that said, things happen that shouldn't all the time. So, um, okay, so that's a super helpful clarification. The next thing I was going to ask, the parent shared that they have applied and been told he's eligible. It sounds to me like he's not yet on the waiting list. That happens most often when the CSB has all of the paperwork that shows, yes, this person is eligible, but they have not had a staff person who has time to kind of cross the T's and dot the I's and finally put him on that waiting list. You have waited more than long enough. Why don't you email me directly right after this and we'll do some strategizing. For anyone who's listening, my general school of thought is 
you know, if someone doesn't reply within a week, ping them, email, call. If someone doesn't reply within two weeks, call or email saying, this is my second ping. I haven't heard. At this point, do I appeal? Do I talk to a supervisor? Who's who's another person who can help me move things along? Because you shouldn't be going weeks and weeks and weeks. It has been years since this happened, but every once in a while, someone will lose paperwork and a parent will think, oh, I should just keep waiting, right? We never want to be in that situation. Yeah, since August. Yeah, let's talk about this. Um, shoot me an email. It's helpful for me to know the community services board where he is applying. Um, and then from there we can talk. And this is a perfect actually wrap up for reach out to us anytime. You can ask me anything about disability services at all. I may not always have the answer, but I will certainly do my best to answer. And if I don't feel like I have a really comprehensive answer, I will point you in the direction of someone who I think does. Um, we love doing that work. It's really meaningful. I joke often that we're there for the ungoogleable. We know how hard it is. We are families of people who have developmental disabilities and all kinds of needs. We want to make life easier for you. So don't hesitate to reach out for anything. Don't ever feel like you're stuck or you're out of options. Thank you all so very much for being here. We'll get the recording out to people as soon as possible. And I look forward to your questions in the future. Have a great day.